Good morning from Melbourne, Australia. Um, it is uh, the morning of, what is our date today? Uh, March 19th, and a date that is so very close to the rapture or harvest of the bride. I have never been so firmly convinced of that. And, um, and I want to be able to come on and to be an encouragement to the, the body of Christ, to the bride of Christ, uh, in an effort to be able to, guys, we've, brothers and sisters, we are so very close now, so very close, excuse me, and I want to be able to uh, talk to us about some things I think that's very important. I think that's going to help edify, that's going to help lift us up, that's going to help revitalize uh, those persons that might feel weary, and we all know about feeling weary, I think, at this particular stage, right? And uh, oh, thank you, Alma. Um, I, I think it's, it's, very, it's very important, especially now, that we are so close to the finish line that we're not derailed, if I can take this from so many so many instances of what's been happening uh, lately, we don't want our faith and our hope derailed so, such that we end up losing our crown or to give up or to think, you know, Jesus, I don't know. We keep thinking he's supposed to come back, but, and I just can't hold on much longer. I'm saying, don't let go. Don't let go. You know, it reminds me of the, you know, there's an old uh, poster, and, and I may, I imagine that many of you have, uh, have heard of it, and that is the, you know, you, you, you see uh, a rope, and then there's a, a little cat that's kind of like holding on to the end of the rope and is just standing there, and it's saying, hold on. You know, and I think sometimes that's what we think about. That's that's what we end up doing. Uh, but I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I I really feel this very strongly, and even more strongly. Ah, oh, Sister Paulette! Oh, so glad you're here. All right, uh, everyone, come on in. I want to be able to discuss with us today the reasoning why I am so firmly convinced that evermore that we are sitting on the threshold of Jesus calling us up. And the reason why I say that is because, and this is not only happening to me, there have been uh, a number of watchmen and watchwomen that have been incredibly attacked by the enemy. And the enemy, that's, that's what I'm saying. You know that when the enemy attacks you, then there is a reason for it. Uh, if, if the enemy is not attacking you, then I would think, you know, hmm, the enemy okay with you, right? So the... The enemy knows his time is short, and uh, and he is really ratcheting up the attempts, as I say, thank you, Abba, uh, to derail all of his bride. And why do I say specifically the bride? I'm saying specifically the bride is because it is the bride of Christ. That is the pre-tribulational harvest. And let me just cover this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover a lot of things. The, the title of this deals with 
doctrines of devils that are trying to turn away the focus from the pre-tribulational bride of Christ. And what am I meaning by this, right? This is, there's, in the last days, we know that there's going to be a lot of doctrines of demons slash devils, whichever um, uh, term you want to be able to use there. We're going to cover this in a little bit of detail. I'm going to discuss initially what some of those doctrines are, what the plan of the enemy is, and what we need to be able to do to make sure that it doesn't affect us. And actually then is a sign for us of how imminently close this is. And then once we do that, what I'm going to do is I want to cover three different scenarios, or should I say three different types and shadows of the bride of Christ. And I'm going to cover that all in Genesis. We're going to cover that all in Genesis, and we're going to look at Eve or Chava. We're going to look at Rebecca, and we are going to look at Asenath. And, uh, and from those three, I want to really focus in on the bride of Christ. And here I want to be able to, to, to say, and I, I differentiate, and there is a differentiation, and I want to highlight this because this is also one of those doctrines that they teach against. And, uh, all right, uh, Holy Spirit, thank you for that. Uh, all right, definitely. All right, so Holy Spirit just prompted into my spirit about another doctrine of demons and one that's highlighted in the book of Revelation, and that's dealing with the number 666, okay? But what I'm trying to say is there is a doctrine that also says, no, everyone that says a quick prayer to Jesus is not only saved, they are also a part of the bride and every single person is going to be raptured at the harvest, right? The barley harvest, the pre-tribulational harvest. And what I want to tell you is one, that is not the case. OK, I want to, to tell you that's not the case. Now, the reason why I'm wanting to tell you this is not to destroy any hope or to upend any uh, uh, any encouragement or faith that you might have. But it's to tell you the truth so that the enemy does not twist scripture in such a way as to get your focus off or to make you think something that is not true. And so I, I want you to understand that. So we're going to cover those three and look forward to the harvest, which is imminent. Okay. So first, let's start by saying a prayer. And, and then uh, I, we're going to have a little moment of levity. Okay. And, uh, and then we're going to get into the seriousness of this because this can happen any moment now, okay? All right. Abba, come on. I, I am so, all of your children are so enamored with you or want to lift you up and praise you and thank you for all that you have done, for sending your son, for saving us, for saving everyone that you have given to Jesus. And I and, and I'm I'm so thankful that you have given us your word so that we may know that we have eternal life through him. Amen. I also want to thank you for the message and I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to anoint the words that I speak and to prepare your bride and to the look forward to with such great anticipation and joy for Jesus to be calling her up any minute now. 
And I'm thinking that you are going to draw, Abba, those that are, are, are just filled with the curiosity, wonder, and the desire to know this word, that they are going to be drawn to you. And in these last moments, that they can be a part of the family know and give praise to you, lifting you up in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. This is what we want to do. Let's start with the discussion of some doctrines of devils, okay? First off, I want to go ahead and use, which I think is a really good explanation <clears throat> from gotquestions.org. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I want to be able to cover that, and then we're going to get into some specifics, okay? All right. First, we want to identify just what are doctrines of demons, and, and then, then we're going to get into some specifics of what that is and how the devil, the enemy, uses that to be able to lead to the destruction of people, okay? So let's start with this. The question, what are doctrines of demons in 1 Timothy 4 verse 1. Now I'm just going to read a lot of this here and then we're going to expound on it, okay? So here is his answer. In many places, scripture warns us against false doctrine. Now one such place is 1 Timothy 4 verse 1. The Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times, the last days, some will fall away from the faith paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Now, that's out of the NASB. Don't shoot the messenger here. The King James words it as seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. I want you to hold on to that. A doctrine is a teaching or a set of principles. The doctrines of demons, then, are things that demons teach. These can be good and, or there can be good and or bad doctrines. The word doctrine can refer to the biblical teachings of a church or a pastor, or in the case of 1 Timothy 4 verse 1, the ungodly teachings of Satan. Those who follow the doctrines of demons will fall away from the faith or fall away from truth just enough to be able to lose something very, very important. And that is hope, all right? That is, heeding the doctrine of demons is a serious matter because it involves a departure from the truth of Christ's gospel. Now, how are these doctrines of demons promulgated? They are delivered through human instructors. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. That's in 1 Timothy 4, verse 2. These false teachers are hypocritical. That is, their lives do not evidence the holiness they seemingly espouse. They are liars. That is, they deal in falsehood and knowingly lead others into apostasy. And they are beyond the reach of conscience. That is, they have found a way in their own minds to justify their lies. Now, these false teachers may be personable, charming, persuasive, but they do not receive the message from the Holy Spirit. Rather, they spout the suggestions of evil spirits whose work is to lead people astray. So what exactly are the doctrines of demons? Now, this is where he goes into something. We're going to expound on this. The immediate context, as it relates to 1 Timothy, gives the idea of the teachings to look out for. They forbid people to marry in order then to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is to be received with thanksgiving. 
because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. That's 1 Timothy 2, or excuse me, 4 verses 2 through 5. So according to this, this passage, we should not follow any person or group that forbids marriage or that places restrictions on certain foods. Any person or group that says holiness comes through a select diet or complete sexual abstinence is lying. I want to go a little bit farther than that because food is something very deep and important, right? In the Garden of Eden, Eve encountered the doctrines of demons as the serpent spoke to her. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat of the tree of the garden? Now, here we see more food, right? That's Genesis 3, verse 1. At the beginning of the conversation, Satan questioned the teaching of God. As they continued to talk, he substituted his own teaching for God's. Satan has continued to use deception, doubt, and subtlety to lead people astray. Satan is the father of lies and a murderer from the beginning, according to John 8, verse 44. And the doctrines taught by his demons through the agency of willing human accomplices continue to separate the people from God and his blessing. Now, this is, this is very important because this is a key point here. Satan knows how to manipulate us. And that is why the doctrines of demons are so effective. We can identify the doctrines of demons by immersing ourselves in the truth. And what is the truth? The word of God is the truth. Jesus is the truth. Okay, so that's, that's what we've got to focus on the truth. Jesus is the living word. Okay. We must read and study our Bibles. When we know what God says on any su given subject, then any deviation from that teaching will send up a red flag. Amen. When we are in tune with God's word, aberrations from that keynote will ring hollow and off key. And I say a double amen to that. So let's actually talk for a minute. So you notice how there was the discussion about abstinence and, and, and uh, so uh, uh, sexual abstinence, not marrying, okay? Well, one of the things that we're discussing here today is exactly about marriage, right? The marriage of the son of man. Uh, uh, Pastor Sandy over at Soldiers for Christ, love him so much. He had just said in a recent, um, a recent message about how he encapsulated the entire message of the word of God. And that was this, the king has prepared a wedding for his son. Amen. There you go. First, beginning, middle, end. There we go. So Jesus, as the son of God, has a bride that's prepared for him. It's all about marriage. So you can see then why then would the devil want to get rid of marriage, talk against marriage? Why? Because the whole word of God is all about it, all about it. And that's one of the deep things we're going to be talking about from Eve all the way through. Okay. All right. So what's the other thing? Food. Abstain from certain foods. Okay. Now, and this is one of the things that we're going to also expound on. So if we abstain from certain foods, I want you to consider that Jesus said that he is the bread from heaven. What did he also say? That unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, then we will have no part in him, right? Right? Okay. So he is equating himself as the living word with food, right? And so we've got to eat everything that's in the word of God. We've got to eat it all. We don't want to take away parts of it 
and separate it out and say, no, 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 I can't have any part of that, right? And you can see where this is going because these doctrines of demons, which are hugely prevalent to now, uh, today as we see the attacks from the enemies occurring, we can see so much from the devil bringing in these doctrines of demons, okay? Now, what I want to talk about here is some more of what those doctrines of demons are, some of those that we can relate to today. So when we notice that there is a huge and growing movement of those who want to consider rightly dividing the word, meaning that you cut out certain parts of the word, wouldn't that be a doctrine of a demon? Because you are saying to abstain, don't eat that part of the word, because that's not for you, right? Do you see where I'm going with this? Okay, that is the doctrines of demons right there. The whole word of God, right? what, what are we told? That the entire word of God is for instruction, for reproof, for in, uh uh, for instruction in righteousness, excuse me, that's uh, for the building up of the person. That's what we want to be able to do. It's all, all uh, in, in, uh, beneficial. It's all, uh, not just part of it, not just like, oh, we're going to take a little bite here. It, you are not then at a feast, right? Which is it's another thing that we have to look forward to. It's a feast, more food, where we're going to have feasting in so much, we're not going to be abstaining from anything there. We are going to be partaking of everything there. Are you following me? All right. So that's what we want to be able to do. All right. So if we are then cutting out part of the word and we are saying it's not for us or it's not beneficial to us or it's for someone else and we shouldn't even consider it, that would be a doctrine of demons. Do you see how that works, right? Anyone that's going to tell you to abstain from part of eating God's word that's going to be a doctrine of demon, according to that context. All right, so let's go a little further then. What about, so the abstaining from, uh, uh, from marriage? Well, there's a lot going on now where how many instances where we see people discussing how the uh, bride of Christ is not people, okay? It's, it's something other than his people, right? It's, it's, it's a building, it's the new Jerusalem, or it's some other thing, or it's some other spiritual entity that's not connected with people, right? So in other words, you, brother, you, sister, are not part of the bride of Christ, because that's for something else. What would that be? That would be telling you to abstain from that marriage. God the Father has picked out a bride for his son. So if, if you're saying that that is not the case, that you can't be a part of it, and he's picked it from his people, we're going to be covering that in some more detail. Okay, so I want you to consider Father God has picked out a bride from his people and he is going to have that bride, those people, those members that come out from the body that's going to actually be married to Christ, okay? And that is the case. So if you are wanting to say that you are being taught 
or it's a tradition in your particular church or denomination that any, no, 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 no. It's, that's not the case. You can't be how, and, and then you justify it by, no, we can't because we're just sinful people, blah, blah, blah. Fill in the blanks with whatever. What would you be saying? You would be saying in essence, that you are to abstain from marrying. Abstain. Do you understand what I'm saying here? So what would that be? That would be a doctrine of demons, okay? So speaking of that, as I mentioned uh, a second ago, about tradition. Now, I want to speak about that for a minute because Everyone is familiar about the, the number, or at least I hope that you are, about the number 666, right? We know that those uh, will know uh, without the mark and uh, that uh, the mark of the beast or the name or the number of his name, those people that receive that mark will not be able to buy or sell during the uh, the great tribulation, right? So that's what's going to happen at that particular time. And uh, we know that it says, here is wisdom. Uh, let him who hears understand that the, the number is 666, 666, right? All right. Well, there have been numbers of people that are trying to determine who is the, what's the number of this man and that sort of thing. Well, we have, and, and so where do we get these number calculations from? Well, it's in uh, what's called gematria or gematria. And that is because in the Greek as well as the Hebrew alphabets, each letter has a numerical equivalent. So what we see when we look at certain things and add up certain numbers and we can see associations mathematically along with the word, which shows the great creator God at, has everything that is connected. It shows that his word is his word. Well, one of those things that come out in uh, Gematria is the word tradition. So in other words, we know that we don't want to hold on to the traditions of men. Jesus came all over the Pharisees for their traditions, which actually did not follow his word, right? All right. Well, we know that when you calculate the, the Hebrew word for tradition there, that number adds up to, guess what, 666. And so I want you to be aware of that. I want you to understand that, that tradition is going to be a doctrine of demons. Why would that be the case? Now, when, when we hold on to a tradition, just for the mere fact that it is a tradition, oh, our church has done that for thousands of years. We've done that, okay? Well, does that mean that, that it's true? Does that mean that it follows the word of God? No, it doesn't mean that at all. The traditions of men actually oftentimes are really, they tend to actually be these doctrines of demons. Because if people are going to hold on tenaciously to doctrines, especially if they're doctrines of men and not doctrine that comes from the principles of the word of God, then what's going to happen is you're not going to be able to learn anything from the Holy Spirit. How can the Holy Spirit impress upon you personally about anything if what is happening is you are saying like, no, I'm holding on to this tradition. 
No, no, you can't get no. Ah, not do, do you understand what I'm saying? All right. But we are told, Daniel t it tells us that the book regarding everything that happens for the end times is going to be sealed up until the time of the end. Now, we see that there are a lot of folks that, I, I, or I should say, excuse me, we see that this book has now been unsealed, right? And so Holy Spirit is actually impressing on people, giving them dreams and visions and prophesying and all of this about these end times and what's happening. And we see that people are going forth, as it says, back and forth from uh, to and fro from the scroll, increasing their knowledge of God's word. That's what this is. But if you hang on to tradition, then you're going to say, no, 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 there's none of that for today. There's where we're holding on again. That's what we're going to, no, can't let go of this. Let go of that and step out in faith, believing what Holy Spirit is trying to tell you. Okay? If you have any question, Test the spirits to find out if what you are hearing is of God. He will give you wisdom and understanding if you ask for it. Okay? That, and I, I encourage you to do that. Don't hold on to these traditions which say there is no rapture. That hold on to... Uh, other things like, oh, I love this, because you're. how many people do we have that don't believe in a rapture? Why not? Because that's what their church teaches, or that's what their denomination holds out to. Have you got into the word? Have you looked in this yourself? Have you been led by the Holy Spirit? Have you asked for that kind of leading to do that? That's how you get personal with God, right? He's a personal God, and he wants you to do that. And I encourage you to do that. You will be so infinitely blessed by it because our Abba loves you. He loves you. He loves you equally with his son, Jesus, who has an infinite level of love for each person. Ah. Oh. God, just, and I've tasted it. I've tasted it. My goodness. I wish that you could truly understand just how much you are loved, how much you are loved. And he's got a reason for why he's coming. He's got a reason for why his plan is the way it is. And he's got a reason for why he waits for his perfect timing to reveal things, okay? All right. And so he is now revealing things that were originally sealed up. Now they're unsealed. But if you say, no, 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 then what the enemy wants you to do is hold on to that 666 tradition of men and say all those other folks that are actually receiving revelation from Holy Spirit then you're saying, no, those are the ones that have doctrines of demons, completely oblivious to the fact that they are the ones being deceived. And I am just saying, you need to have your eyes open. You need to pray that that Holy Spirit will open your eyes that you can receive this. Don't. And it, so here's the other thing, right? Other people are saying like, no, yeah, there's no, there's no rapture or anything. He's coming hundreds of years from now, right? And, uh, oh, yeah, I believe he's coming. I believe he's coming. Just not today or this year or maybe not in my lifetime. Well, <laughs> there is another doctrine of demons. Why? Hold on to this. What's another doctrine of demon? I'm going to cover all of these, right? Another doctrine of demon. I've read my Bible. And what that means in 
in uh, prideful religious speak is, I have read one chapter of the Bible, and that is Matthew chapter 24, and I have read these words. No man knows the day or the hour. Now, I don't know anything else about any of the prophets. I don't know anything else about any other thing. I, I have just gotten the word that I need that satisfies me that says, whew, ah, I don't have to read the word anymore because no one can know. And that makes me feel a lot better because then I am released from having to get into God's word. I don't want to get in there and you know, try to you know, figure things out or learn about God or anything like that. Woo! I'm so thankful that I don't have to do that. Why? Because they have just swallowed whole that doctrine of demon. That doctrine of demons is that no man can know that you think that you know what that word means is, and you think that gives you justification for not reading his word. No, it does not. You are accountable for it, whether you want to believe that or not. And But what I'm telling you is if you would cast aside that doctrine of demon, uh, demons that you would find out that there is this beautiful paradise of words, this feast of God's word that he has for his bride, for his body, for his remnant people. And I, I'm, I'm saying that you can know about that. He has opened it up and he has it available for you if you will cast aside these doctrines of demons. And why are these all doctrines of demons? What do they all have in common? They get your focus off of Jesus. They get your focus out of the word. And they make you complacent and asleep and focused on the world. That's what it is. Because that's what the enemy, Satan, is all about. That's what it's about, okay? And, uh, and, and so it's easy for all of those folks to say, you know, uh, it's all of the other folks. It's, it's the point the fingers with no accountability to me. It's not me. It's all you guys. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you're believing all of these things, which just aren't true, because if you believed my church, or you believe what my pastor told me. What? No, I, I actually, well, I trust my pastor. Yeah, you know, God, you know, what do you mean? Did I read the word? God, I, I looked at that one verse, you know, and so that must be true, right? All right. Well, what I'm trying to say is, the word of God truly is a feast. Don't abstain from any of the food that God has declared as clean because all of God's word is clean. Do you understand? Read it. Have Holy Spirit open up your eyes of understanding and your heart to receive this wonderful information that he has, okay? Because the time is very short. Let's talk about the other doctrine of demon, the abstaining from marriage. It's all God's word, the whole plan of it, the whole Bible is a love letter. It is the plan of God our Abba Father, to get a bride for his son. It's all throughout the Bible from the beginning to the end. So if you are believing like maybe the Catholic Church and they say, no, you know, they're, they're priests, they can't be married, or uh or anything like that, or uh, why? That would be a doctrine of demons, right? That's what 1 Timothy 4, 
verse 1 tells us that is specifically what is being addressed there. Let's talk about what the truth is, however. Let's get into the word and let's talk about it. Our Abba has shown us so much through his word. And uh, we're going to start by talking about some brides. And I'm only going to discuss three of them today. There are many, many more. But let's start with Hala or Eve. Now, there's one thing that, that, that we want to point out here. I'm going to read just an excerpt from Genesis chapter 2, starting at verse 18 through verse 24, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's wet the whistle. Ah, thank you, Abba. All right, verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man, Adam, should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam... There was not found and help me for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he, God, took one of his ribs, very good, one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman, because she was taken out of a man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now, here we have the very first marriage in the Bible, and it's in the very second chapter of the Bible. Okay, so we're starting early, folks. Let's discuss a couple of things out of here we have an identification that there is a recognition. This is a recognition. So Adam is given the dominion, and he's got this mission to name everything that is living, all of this created things, right? The cattle, the fowl of the air, every beast of the field, everything, right? So all of these were brought to Adam, and he names them. Now, it's it's not it's like, well, we're going to call this one a giraffe. Why? Because it jurs and it wraps. No, it doesn't mean that. What it means, any time we discuss something in the Bible regarding the names to each one, because they perfectly represented the character and attributes of the thing named, right? But then there was this recognition there wasn't one for him. We see all of these creatures, and they're male and female, and we can see that, wow, okay, that's that's perfect for them, but there's not one for me. And so, but before that, there was the recognition by the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, right? that said in verse 18, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make and help meet for him. So in other words, this is, uh, this is the recognition before even Adam sees it. Now, that's we say Adam, that's his name. 
It means it's a dom. It means man, right? So, or mankind. So that's what we see. So uh, Adam or Adam, he doesn't even recognize it yet, but God has already recognized that it's not good for him to be alone and that there is going to be a wife created for him, right? All right. Uh, uh, let's see. Okay. Everything going okay? I just want, I noticed that there's a couple of people that says that they have lost their feed, but they're, that it's back. Is everyone receiving okay? Just want to make sure that that there's no problem on my end and that you're seeing everything okay. Ah, okay, good. Thank you for letting me know that. So Abba, uh, okay, okay. Thank you, Sister Paula. Um, all right, so then we see that in the very plan of God, the first man, he has already declared that he's going to make a wife for him, right? All right. Now, what's interesting about this, and I've discussed this before in other messages, and uh, and other people tend to to get this so so wrong, and 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 I'm thinking, we'll discuss that in a second. So, God takes the man Adam. Mm, pardon me that he has formed. Now, this is a fully formed Adam. It's his full body, head, hands, feet, the whole thing, right? This is a full man. And so what he has happened is he's having Adam fall into a, a, a deep sleep. You notice how it's not just sleep. He falls into a deep sleep, which is symbolic of death. And it says, and God took, right? And he took. God did the taking. So he did the selecting here, right? He took one of his ribs. Now, this, I really want you to see just how important this is. Does a person have more than one rib? Yeah, right? So does a person have more than one finger? Yeah, you, you've got lots of them, right? At least 10 of them. And uh, they're different. What's it? So take a look at your hands for a minute and just take a look at it. So each is a member, right? You notice how on your hand, you've got four fingers and a thumb. They still qualify as digits, right? But the thumb is different from these four. And you notice how these four, every single one of them is a different length. There's a difference in some way. And every single one of the digits have their own unique mark, their own unique fingerprint, right? And then you've got another one over here. And the same thing applies. Every little mark, every little fingerprint is completely unique and every single one, but they're all digits, right? Okay, so the same thing I want to say when we talk about the body, Paul talks about the body. Now, the body of Christ is composed of many members, members, digits, parts, right? So he doesn't say the, the body is composed of a finger, one finger, or one finger is representative of all fingers, right? You've got many different parts. You've got more than one eye. You've got, uh, uh, thankfully, we've only got one mouth, right? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> because sometimes we can actually get into that. But my point is, you've got this entire rib cage, right? There's a whole bunch of ribs there. And we don't just say that, that God took your rib cage. He didn't. It says he selected one of the ribs. So there is a rib cage here. 
and it's protecting the heart. It's covering the heart. And he takes one. He selected it and he took it out. So one out of all of the members of the body, we see that God himself selected this one particular one, this particular rib, and it says that he made woman from it. Uh, depending upon the, uh, the translation that you read, some can say he fashioned it. Uh, but actually, the Hebrew word there actually means built, right? And it's different. In other words, he created the woman differently in the manner that he created the man. It says he formed the man out of the dust of the earth, but he created or built the woman from the rib he selected, okay? Okay. I think that is very, very interesting. Now to point this out, so what am I saying? I want you to hold on to this whole thing being that the bride of Adam, his wife was taken out of his body. It was one member, one rib. So there's number of ribs, right? but he took only one of them. He didn't take all of them. He didn't use his whole body. He didn't have him like, just like divide, like cell division and go, there we go. There's husband and wife. No, he didn't do that at all. He independently of his own volition, God, Abba, takes then specifically uh, points out the rib and then fashions the woman. And then he, God, brings the woman to Adam. And Adam is ecstatic. He's just like, whoa, whoa. Okay, this is the Wayne paraphrase here, but you can kind of get this from the, from the scripture, right? And he says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She is a part of me. We are like this. She shall be called woman. Or because she was taken out of man. When she said that she was man, no, she said it was taken out of man. So here we, once again, we see that the bride, even Adam saying the bride was taken out of his body. Do you understand what I'm saying? You really got to grasp onto this because the word of God is quite plain about it. And if you will try to, you know, just get rid of, no, 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 no tradition. Blah, 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 blah. No, I can't hear you. Ah, la, 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 la. You know, don't do that. Be open to the word of God and say, Abba, Holy Spirit, I'm asking for you to show me. I'm having a hard time with this because of what I've been taught. And, and so I'm just asking for you, show me if this is the truth. Show me if this is the truth. I want to believe your word. I want to believe all of your word. And I want to know you, Jesus. I want to know you. And this word all speaks of you. And I'm asking for you to show me. Do that for me, Abba, in Jesus' name. Amen. Right? Okay. So here we've got this. And what is this called? We see in verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave. Now we discussed that in a couple of other messages. <clears throat> where the word cleave has both, has two meanings, one meaning and its opposite meaning. They're antonyms, right? So it, 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 it is, um, or contronyms, depending upon which one you want to look at. So cleave can mean separate, you know, to divide apart, or it can mean to cleave or to join together. And in this instance, what we see is the cleaving is the joining of the man unto his wife. And it says they shall become 
one flesh. So in other words, you can't get anything about cleaving being separating because it shows they are joined as one flesh. Do you understand what I'm saying? All right. Now, I hope that you get that. And we've just started. Okay. Oh, uh, I'm going to try to to finish this as much. So let's then talk about the next bride of Christ or the type of the bride of Christ. Uh, oh, yeah, I like that, Carol. I just noticed 24 elders equals 24 ribs, bride of Christ. That's interesting. Uh, I haven't looked at that. We'll, we'll, con we'll consider there's obviously that there's so much, there's so much that's that we can find this connection with, but I, I want to focus just on this one thing. We want to get rid of the doctrines of demons that say that the bride of Christ does not come from the body of Christ or that it's not any people or that it's some uh, supernatural being or something like that or some uh, uh, inanimate object or, or you understand what I'm saying? All of those, all of these different things are all doctrines of demons, right? because they all want you to get your focus off understanding that you could actually be part of the bride, that Abba could be drawing you and wanting you to see that he has chosen you and that you can then be a part of that. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? That you will then have faith, <coughs> excuse me, Believing faith in that. And I'm not talking about believing faith for salvation because this is not a salvation issue, right? That is completely different, but you're not going to be uh, a part of the body unless you are saved, right? That is not going to happen. You have to be in Christ, so you have to be in the body before that can even be a possibility right? And that saving grace through faith in the finished work of Jesus on the cross is how you get there. That's the start. That's the beginning. That's the placement, right? So you have to be called and uh, you have to be chosen, called, and faithful. I actually have three messages that separate this out Previously, I, I encourage you to look for that. Uh, that, uh, that, yeah, and I see that, Sister Paulette, so much circulating on YouTube that the bride is only one physical woman. Now, if that is in fact the case, that's what I'm saying, what you will find, and the reason why we're going to see this here, we're going to see that the spiritual bride of Christ. And that's what this is. You are the spiritual bride. It is, we see these earthly representations that speak of a spiritual reality. And so I want you to understand that if you are holding on to something earthly, then guess what? And so that once again means, oh, oh, let's see, I'm a man. So therefore, the bride of Christ is only one physical woman. Therefore, it can't be me. Therefore, I, I'm just going to forget about it, right? Doctrine of demons. All of them do the same thing. So you've got, you know, untold numbers of demons that are speaking to try to influence people. Don't read the word. Don't think about that. This doesn't have anything to do with you. This is about someone else. This is about something else, right? Oh, oh my goodness. So don't believe that. Think about it. All right. Let's go into discussing uh, Rebecca. Okay. And she is another type of Christ. And, um, and what I'm going to read is, I'm going to read, uh, this is from a section out of uh a teaching that was done by a, a sister named Lynn Mize. And 
I, I think it's an excellent teaching. It's it um, it has a lot that we can use here. I'm going to use an excerpt out of it because, well, we're already at one hour, so I'm trying to be able to get this through first. Okay, but let's go ahead and read. Let's see, did I have? I want to read. Genesis uh, 24 verses 1 through uh, 1 through 4 1 through uh, Genesis 24 1 through 16 okay and then, and then we're going to talk about that and break that down because I think that that's that's very interesting all right so and we're going to read out of the King James version uh, and then we're going to break it down and dis discuss these, right? All right. So in Genesis 24, now I also want you to understand this. The reason why I'm starting with Eve, and then I'm going to Rebecca, and then I'm going to Asenath, is because each one comes after the other. This is a building that we have going on. And then we see more and more, and we see how they relate to each other. And it is just absolutely stunning when we look at it. All right. So Genesis 24, verse 1. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, put, I pray thee, <coughs> excuse me, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. But thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, Peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from which thou camest? <clears throat> Excuse me. And Abraham said unto him, Beware thou that thou not uh, bring not my son thither again. Don't do it. Verse 24, uh, four, excuse me, verse 7. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife Wife, 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 I want you to, we're going to harp on that. It's all about a wife. Unto my son from thence. And if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath. Only bring not my son thither again. And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swear to him concerning this matter. And the servant took 10 camels of the camels of his master and departed for all of the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Nahor. And he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even at the time that women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. And, it came, and let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she shall say, drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. 
let the same be she that thou has appointed for thy servant Isaac. And thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. Let's see. And it came to pass before he had done speaking that behold, Rebekah came out who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher upon her shoulder. And the damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin, neither had any man known her. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. Now, I'm going to stop there because we're going to, we're going to try to, we're going to cover a lot of things because I really want to get down into just what this first part is, the finding of Rebecca, who then ultimately becomes the wife of uh, Isaac. So, all right. So here we have in our first verse that Abraham was old and stricken in age, right? And, uh, and so what we see here is that Abraham is a type of God the Father. And his great age is supposed to be representative of the eternality of God, right? And so uh, in verse 2, we see that he says unto his eldest servant, that uh, to he's going to have him swear. Well, the eldest servant is a type of Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has charge over all of the Father's goods. In verse 3, we see that based on the charge, the wife or bride is not to come from the unsaved, but from among God's people. Now, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to highlight here. Now, we, we don't have the church yet, obviously, but what, now that we have the church revealed in the New Testament, then we can go back and we can see these hidden types and shadows uh, that were in the Old Testament. And I see this as being one of those, that this is the reason why he has Eliezer, excuse me, representative of the Holy Spirit, to have him seek a bride out of his people, not the Canaanites, right? Not of the world, but out of his people, the church. Now, we're, we're, we're going to discuss that. Is this going to be the instance? There are so many different types and shadows that we deal with here that we need to look at. All right. But thou shalt go into my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. Now, the Hebrew white word for country means the whole world. Isn't that awesome? It means the whole world and not just one part of the world. That is confirmation that Rebecca is a type of the bride of Christ who comes from the church and not Israel, okay? The word for kindred, this is awesome too, folks. The word kindred means offspring, or in this case, that would be the children of God. The bride for Isaac, a type of Jesus, was to come from God's children, the church, and the church comes from the whole world. This is very, I, I, I want you, we, when we parse these, when I do these things, and we do these deep dives, okay, that whole thing is to keep us from being superficial. This top level surface reading, or just skimming over. No, you need to get down into this world OK, uh, this this is very scriptural here. OK. All right. And uh, and and it reveals so much. All right. So in verse five, uh, then the question is asked, what is, if the 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 woman's not willing to follow him? Right. Should should I bring the son back? 
right? And he goes, no, it's the bride's choice as to whether she will follow the servant, which is a type of Holy Spirit. The bride is willing to go to this new land. We know that's what this is said. She is asked ultimately, will you go with this man? And she says, what? I will go. Why? Because it was her choice. It is all our choice to whether our personal choice, are we going to go? Are we going to, you know, be called and go all of that distance? Are we going to go that, that whole journey to be married to Christ? Are we going to do that? And the bride says, I will go, right? And that's, that's what you've got to know about that. Okay, in verse 6, Abraham says, "Be no, don't bring my son back. Jesus will not come back to the world to get his bride. The bride will go to him and uh, at his home in heaven. And this is confirmed in that Rebecca follows the servant or Holy Spirit through the wilderness of her own free will to go home to the bridegroom. And we see that. And what's interesting is we also see if uh, in cutting to the chase down here, when, when she goes, she's lifted up onto the camels, right? And she's brought to uh, where she's able to see Isaac at a distance, right? And then Isaac starts coming towards her. She then asks, who is this man? He says, this, this is Isaac. This is going to be your husband. So what does she do? She puts the veil over her face to identify her as the bride. And she goes and they meet each other. Do you understand? So the bride, when the bride is taken, we meet, we see Jesus up in the air. Who is that man? Oh, that's Jesus, right? And Jesus then says, in a voice that speaks to each of us by name. Now, that's not what we have here, but we know that that's ultimately what's going to happen. It's going to have a loud command, just as when Jesus called out, Lazarus, come out, right? What's he going to say? He's going to say, Wayne, come up here. He's going to say to each and every one of you that's a member of the bride, he's going to call you out, Sister Paulette, come up here. He's going to call all of his bride by name and call them up. And we are going to meet him in the clouds and be taken to the Father's house. All right? Okay. Uh, so that's, that's what we have there. All right. Uh, uh, let's jump to verse eight. And if the woman will not be willing, you're, you're cleared of this charge. That's another a reiteration that the bride chooses of her own free will to follow Holy Spirit and to be the bride of Christ. I have said in a number of places that it is a personal choice if you're going to be the bride, right? It is a self-selection process in a way. Now, when I say that, of course, Abba chooses a bride for his son. And we then have the free will choice whether we want to say yes to that or not. And I'm, I'm telling you, I'm encouraging everyone that hears this in the sound of my voice right now, if you hear this right now, you need to first off, if you haven't, say yes to Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, and then, then say yes to being uh, a member of the bride. Called, chosen, and faithful. That is what the bride is, okay? All right. So, and... Uh, the let me jump down here. Hmm. 
All right. Uh, in verse, this is interesting. Okay. Uh, in verse 11, he had, and it says, he has made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even at the time the women go out to draw water. We see this in a number of places, the woman at the well, right? The Samaritan woman and those types of things. Or when uh, Jesus says, uh, go looking for a man that has a pitcher of water on his shoulder, you know, but all of this relates to all of that, the water. It all relates to the word and it relates to being the bride because that's, that's what that is, right? Okay, what this says here is that the well is a type of the word of God, right? The root word for well is as follows. It's the Hebrew word ba'ar. That is a primitive word root that means to dig by analogy to engrave or figuratively to explain, right? And so that in the King James, what we have is the word to declare or to make plain, right? So you can see where that is. Um, the primary purpose of Holy Spirit is to perform the will of Abba, the Heavenly Father. The primary purpose of Holy Spirit in the current age that we are in right now, this age of grace, is to find a bride for Jesus, right? That's what this is all about. Now, so uh, here in verse 13, behold, I stand here at the well of water and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. So the Holy Spirit will find the bride from among those who frequent the well or those who spend their time in the word of God. Hear, hear me, brothers and sisters, hear me on this. The whole, and let me say this again. Holy Spirit will find the bride from among those who frequent the well, who are intimate with the word of God, intimate with Jesus, or those who spend time in the word and draw much water from the well. Water is a symbol or type for cleansing. <clears throat> washing by the water of the word, right? It's also a type for Holy Spirit. The bride will be taken from among those who are cleansed regularly and who are filled with Holy Spirit. The word for daughters also means, amazingly, apple or pupil of the eye. The apple of God's eye. Does that bring you to that? These are the ones who are closest to the heart of God. Oh, please hear me, brothers and sisters. Please hear me. This is, and, and if you want to say that having to, re, well, first off, it's not having to at all. Somebody that wants to be intimate with Jesus knows that you find out more about his word. If anyone who knows that they will find out more about their spouse in this manual that we call the Word of God and loves the spouse, is going to love finding out more about him, finding out all of these golden nuggets of information, okay? That's what it is. That's what it is, okay? Uh this is interesting, right? I, I, I really like this too. And I want you to consider this and let it come to pass. This is verse 14 again, that the damsel to whom I will say, let down thy pitcher, I pray thee that I may drink. And she shall say, drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac, and thereby, for, excuse me, thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. 
So the bride will not only be cleansed and filled with Holy Spirit herself, but she will also open the word of God to others. Amen. Who will also be cleansed and filled with Holy Spirit. Oh, I get that. That, that will speak volumes. That will speak volumes. I want to jump down and, and end on this. Uh, and that was in verse 16. And the damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin, neither had any man known her, and she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. Now, although there is so much packed just in that one thing, I'm going to just discuss the word for virgin, which is used here, and that is the Hebrew word Bethulal, and it is the feminine passive participle of an unused root meaning to separate. Now, that's going to harken back again as I talked about the cleaving, the word to cleave. That means to separate as well as to join. Now, here, here the, the root meaning here is to separate a virgin from her privacy, sometimes by continuation, a bride, also figuratively a city or a state. So we know that the King James Virgin here discusses it as a maid or virgin. She is pure. She is chaste, right? She has been cleansed by the water of the word. She's a chaste virgin, which is a symbol for or a type of being pure. She was undefiled by the world or the things of the world. She went to the Bible, the well, and she filled her pitcher, a vessel that is a type of the body, right? Jesus said, fill the six water pots with water. And then what does he do? He transforms those stone pots, which are symbols of the body right? Six, the number of man, the body of man, and they were filled with the water that then he turns to wine. Amazing. And where was that done? At a wedding, okay? So don't abstain from marrying. We can also talk about how, you know, there's the other side of that coin where it says that this is also going to be like the days of Noah, that they are going to be marrying and giving in marriage. But the interesting thing about that, this is an aside, the interesting thing about that is what kind of marrying and giving in marriage did they do? Well, interestingly, think about it just a moment. Think about it just a moment because the only people that were saved were eight. Noah, his wife, his sons, and their wives, right? But it says that the people, all of those, that means the entire world that perished was marrying and giving into marriage along with doing the other things, that just having uh, just a wonderful time, right? Living in the world. So what kind of marriage would they be having? Would that be a godly marriage? Would that be a marriage that highlights, uh, you know, the, the God of creation? Or would that be a, a, a marriage to the world or the marriage to those that belong to the enemy, the marriage to idols? Are you following what I'm saying here? So, yeah, they're, they're all marrying and giving into marriage and they were all judged for it as well. So I want you to consider that as, uh, as part of that understanding. Uh, she came up, right? Oh, my goodness. She was the type. In this type, she was filled with the Holy Spirit. And the word for came up means to ascend, brothers and sisters. Means to ascend, to depart to be taken up. 
what do we see in that? That is the rapture of the bride, right? This is clearly a picture of the separation, a departure from the earth because of studying and obeying the Bible and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, for those that might then say, oh my goodness, he's preaching works. And then once again, you would be wrong as I've listed before, that salvation is only through faith by grace in Jesus, his finished work on the cross. Believing and trusting in that alone, that he died on that cross, God in the flesh, and that he was buried and that he arose three days later. If you believe in that, believe and I don't mean just like an intellectual belief, folks. It means to believe, to trust in it, to put all of your faith in the fact that he has paid and done something you cannot do. You can't pay for this yourself, but he has already done so. And God came down in the form of uh, God the Son, came down, became, you know, took on flesh, and then uh, suffered and died on that cross as a payment for the sin debt, 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 that you cannot pay. You cannot pay it, but you can receive it as a free gift through faith. And I pray that you do that today if you haven't done so. And if you just say, oh yeah, I believe that he did it, that is not the kind of belief that saves you. We're not talking about an intellectual assent. I believe that God, you know, that, or that Jesus lived. I believe that he was a good guy. I believe that he had every intention. You know, he, he, he did this for me. That, that you really have to think about whether or not you fully believe with your heart. Because after all, that's what Jesus is after. He's after your heart. Okay. All right. Now what we're going to go in, <laughs> I'm hoping that this is really, really speaking to you because I'm going to discuss now. Now we're going to go to discuss Asana. Okay. And this is in the story of Joseph and Joseph, as many of you know, and if you don't know, I'm going to let you know that Joseph is a type of Christ. And, and what happens to him, and <clears throat> excuse me, more water. Ah, thank you, Baba. Ah, all right. So that, and then Asnath is the bride that was given to him by Pharaoh. And we're going to discuss this in deep detail. Remember, this is another deep dive. All right. So what happens then? What do we see in Asana? Well, what we see is a Gentile bride that is given to Joseph before seven years of tribulation take place, seven years of famine on the earth, okay? That's a, a quick covering, but we're going to discuss it in detail. Let me let me do something. Can, let's take a, a, a little laugh break for a moment here, okay? I was actually, before, before I came on, and, uh, and this was the, the thing... This is another thing I think that would also qualify as a doctrine of demons. And what is that? That Abba is a sourpuss, that he is a frowny face, that he doesn't have a sense of humor, that, and none of this could be farther from the truth. Those types of beliefs really tend to push you away and separate you from God who wants to 
receive you. It's uh, the word tells us that it's his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He, he wants to give it to you, but he can't give it to you. You know, if you're sitting here going, no, uh, uh, okay. Well, what I've been looking at, and uh, as of late, I was looking at a few um, uh, few videos, and uh, and it was to try to get a little chuckle. And it was, uh, it's called Hallelujah Roll Call. Now, this is a biblical twist on what is a very worldly R&B song, okay, called Roll Call. All right. Now, one of the things is in this Roll Call, you, 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 you're identifying who you are and things about you, you know, okay? And so my name is Wayne. Okay. okay. So I was doing that. <clears throat> and so the hallelujah roll call, it's, it's very cute because it discusses things. It, it, it identifies characters in the Bible and, and it's done in, in a very cute way and not at all like the filthy, dirty, worldly version. Okay. And so I, I was, I was thinking, as I encourage you to look it up if you're not familiar with it, and it, it is it is cute. So what I was doing is I was thinking like, before I came on here, I'm thinking like, yeah, yeah, I could do that. I could get into it. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Ro, call my name is David. I am a king. I killed a giant with a stone throw from my sling. I'm... I am a writer, play music too. I rode Messiah who died for me and you. He is a lion. He is a lamb. He's the mighty God, the son, the great I am. You, you see what I'm doing? It's like, I mean, it was just, it's catchy. And it just, it, it seems like these things. So I was just doing that. I just came up with this just uh, at the start. So I encourage you, you know, do that. Put that in the comments. Try to think, you know, who would you be? Who would you like to speak to? And, uh, you know, uh, what about the, you know, uh, my name is Eve. <laughs> you know, I ate the fruit, you know, whatever. I just think it's. <laughs> so anyway. All right. So anyway, that's that, that's a little bit of an aside. But my point is saying. Our Abba has a sense of humor. And so does our Jesus. And I remember when I stood before him and I was doing things that made Jesus chuckle, made him laugh. Why? Because we know when we see our children doing things that can just make us, we think are so cute, right? And then we laugh about it. We have to laugh. It's going like, you know, uh, little Wayne did, did something today. It just made me laugh. It was just, it was so heartwarming, you know? All right. So, Anyway, uh, let's get back uh, to Asana, and we're going to discuss, this is now out of Genesis chapter 41, okay? And uh, I am not going to, uh, I'm going to read a, a, a hefty chunk of this, but uh, we're, we're going to just, uh, not the whole thing, but I'm going to, I'm going to leave a, a certain part out of it that we don't not uh, have to think about. All right. But let's start at, at verse one and, uh, and and try to get through this. And we're going to then discuss about another uh, type and shadow of the bride of Christ in Asana. Verse 41, or excuse me, verse one, Genesis chapter 41. And it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. And behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favored kind and fat-fleshed, and they fed in a meadow. And behold, seven other kind came up after them out of the river, ill-favored and lean-fleshed, and stood by the other kind upon the brink of the river. 
and the ill-favored and lean-fleshed kind did eat up the seven well-favored and fat kind. So Pharaoh awoke. And he slept and dreamed the second time, and behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk, rank and good. And behold, seven thin ears and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them. And the seven thin ears devoured the seven rank and full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. And he sent and called for the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. But then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. Pharaoh was wroth with his servants and put me in the ward in the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker. And we dreamed a dream in one night, I and he. We dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was there with us a young man, an Hebrew, servant of the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted for us our dreams to each man according to his dream he did interpret. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 13, and it came to pass as he interpreted to us, so it was. Me he restored unto mine office, and him he hanged. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. And they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, In my dream, behold, I stood at the bank of the river, and he then tells him about all of his dreams, those two dreams. We're going to go there. Uh, and then uh, after he, he said, uh, and Joseph said unto Pharaoh, this is in verse 25, the dream of Pharaoh is one. God has showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good kind are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dream is one. And the seven thin and ill-favored kind that came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. And there shall arise after them seven years of famine, and all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt. <clears throat> and the famine shall consume the land, and the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of the famine following, for it shall be very grievous. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh, look out a man discreet and wise, and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this, and let him appoint officers over the land, and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years, and let them gather all the food of those good years that come, and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh, and let them keep food in the cities. And that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land perish not through the famine. Verse 37, and the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, highlight this verse, folks. Verse 38, and Pharaoh said unto his servants, can we find 
such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? Amen. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Forasmuch as God hath showed this, thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as, though, as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. Now, verse 42. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand. That's a signet ring, folks. And put it on Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures, uh, vestures of fine linen. That's white clothing. And put a gold chain about his neck. And he bade him to ride in the second chariot which he had. And they cried before him, bow the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. Verse 44. Now we're getting into all of this is just, it's so much pretext necessary to be able to show you. In verse 44, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh. And without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zathna Pa'aneah. And he gave him to wife Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. Verse 46, watch this now. And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. And in the seven plenteous years, the earth brought forth by handfuls. And he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt, and he laid up the food of the cities, the food of the field which were round about every city laid he up in the same. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea very much until he left numbering, for it was without number. And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came. Now that's very important. Which Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On, bare unto him? And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For God said, He hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second he called Ephraim. For God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of of my affliction and the seven years of plenteous that was in the land of Egypt were ended. And so let me jump down. Uh, verse 56. Uh, and no, okay, that's, that's what we'll stop there. And the seven years of dearth, this is verse 54. We'll stop here. According as Joseph has said, and the dearth was in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt, there was bread. Now, one of the things that I, I want to highlight several different things. So I, there, there's a whole study that we could do that discusses about uh, Joseph being the uh, type of Christ. And, and you can see it just throughout and Pharaoh being a type of the father, okay? And so what we're going to do is we're going to discuss, though, about how he's then, wow, he, he, he goes up from the well, and now he's, he's uh, up out of prison. He's released from prison, and he becomes second in charge in the palace to Pharaoh. And uh, 
And so it, it's wonderful. But once again, what are we discussing here? I want this to hearken back to the doctrine of demons, to abstain from food that God has declared clean. Now, why would we be discussing that here? Because this whole thing discusses about bread being in the land during the land of plenty and then a famine of food. We know that there's another scripture that says that there will come a day that there will be a famine, not a famine of bread, but a famine of hearing the word of God. And so that, that's, that's what all of this is talking about, right? Jesus is the bread of heaven, right? We know that that's the, the case here. And what is happening is during this age of grace, that would, I believe, qualify as the seven years of plenty. God talking about the, uh, the seven being the number of divine completion. That's what we have here. All right. Now, let's talk then. We have all of the authority over all of the land of Egypt is given by Pharaoh to Joseph. And what's interesting about that is that after he does that, what's the first thing that he also does, right? He delivers his authority, and then he then gives Asnath to uh, Joseph to wife, okay? Now, this is, uh, this, this is very interesting here because if we know that Pharaoh is a type of God the Father in this particular instance, we see once again how the Father has chosen the bride for Joseph, the type of Christ. And he brings her to Joseph, to wife, okay? Now, let's. what we want to do is we want to discuss all of these things dealing with Asenath. Now, let's discuss some of these things. The woman Joseph received was named Asenath. Now, there's a name. Her name means belonging to the goddess Neith. Neith was known as the Mother Earth goddess of the Delta. Okay. Uh, she was worshipped as the mother of the Egyptian gods. Isis, Horus, and Osiris. This goddess was known as the source of all wisdoms. The Egyptians believed that all the other gods would go to Neith for counsel when they had a dispute among themselves. So what do we see from this? We see that's, uh, the, that Asenath is a pagan, or she was brought up in the world. She was taken up out of the world, right? Uh, and, uh, and so right now she's believing in uh, pagan gods. So in other words, so she is then taken from that. And, and this is very interesting too. So it also points out that Asenath is the daughter of Potipira, the priest of On. Now, that uh, his name means given by the sun god. On, also known as the Heliopolis, was one of the most important religious cities. Uh, I, I think that, let's see, I want to make sure that I've got here the uh, the name for uh, Joseph because I think that that's very important. Uh, let's see. Uh, do, 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 do. Bear with me. I'm going to make sure I'm going to look back at my notes because this is quite important. Uh, and I have 
have it written down here. And of course, I would write it in a place where it, it's not going to help me, right? Okay, so let's let's talk about uh, Joseph's name, which is uh, uh, doo -doo -doo, where do I have him? Hold on, folks. I have it written down, but I'm going to have to just go back. What do we do? We go to back to the word, right? And he, uh, so uh, we know that in verse 45, Pharaoh gives Joseph a new name. And that name is Zatna Pane uh, Paanya. Okay. And so though that name actually has a couple of meanings and those meanings deal with uh one being savior of the world and that's how we know that uh it, it's another type of the uh, uh of joseph being a type of christ right but what's interesting about that name is uh, it shows that it actually has two different meanings, that it's not only savior of the world, but it's also revealer of secrets. And, and that harkens back to uh, Amos 3, verse 7, do we see that you know, God will do no thing unless he reveals it to his servants, the prophets. That's one of the things that we see out of this, right? And, uh, but, uh, so that is another big thing about this. We see that Joseph was 30 years old, and, uh, and of course, he's uh, given Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On, and so that what we see see also the uh, uh, the important things here is so the bride for Christ is a Gentile bride that is taken from the world and then given to Joseph the type of Christ, right? And, and one of the interesting things I see about this is that the uh, when they have children, because we don't hear anything else about this, but we do see that something that's very important is that there are two children that are born to Joseph and his wife. And what's interesting is, or I think is interesting, is that they're both named Hebrew names. They are no longer given names. And another thing that's very interesting about this too, it was common in uh, Egyptian society to have more than one wife. And, uh, and what we see here is that Joseph, uh, as the type of Christ, only has one wife. And, uh, and so we also see, I, I, I think it's just very interesting that all the things point to the, the salvation issues. So uh, we, we see that, uh, although we don't have evidence of this, but we see that uh, where the God of Israel is the impacting um, influence in their lives. And I think that that's also the case that we have for Asnath as the wife too. I would like to believe that she has now turned away from her foreign gods and she cleaved, right? She left her father and mother, right? She was the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On's uh, family. So she leaves father and mother 
and is cleaved to her husband, right? And so that's that's very, I think, very interesting. We see these particular types of instances. Here's another one. All of this happens in the seven plenteous years. And we see this, as I say again, I see this as a type of the age of grace where this is happening. That's where all of the plenteousness and the this fruitfulness is taking place to be followed by seven years of famine, which is a type of the 70th week of Daniel or the seven year period of tribulation that is coming upon this world. There is the bride and they have children and all of this happens. So he's given the bride, his bride before the years of famine. So what would that mean? That would be a type of the pre-tribulational rapture of the bride. That's what I want to uh, just highlight right there, folks. All right. So that I'm hoping that what you see, there's so much more. That it, there's just so much more there. But let me just kind of wrap this up and just go back to what we've seen. We've had doctrines of demons which are proliferating right now because there is so much more attacking by the enemy because I believe that the harvest of the bride, the rapture of the bride, the pre-tribulational rapture of the bride of Christ is imminent. So the enemy is aware of that. And so he is trying desperately to, uh, to attack those uh, in any way that he can that believe that or to turn others away from it. That's how he wins. That's how he wins. And brothers and sisters, I'm, I'm saying that this is not a time to let the enemy win. This is a time to hold on with a vice grip to your crown because he's about to call us up. Once again, the whole Bible is about a father gaining a bride for his son. And that bride is a spiritual bride, not an earth-centered bride. There is an earth-centered bride, but it's not the bride of Christ. That's for another issue. Let's focus now because on the bride of Christ, and in these three instances, we see three types and shadows of that bride. While there are many, many more, I want you to see just how close we are and how much, how rich God's word is when you get down into it and you really you just pull up, you get so much. I, I mean, I'm just thinking like, wow, when you think like, oh, I there's that word. I didn't see that word before. And then you see that one word and that one word just opens up this whole new meaning. And I don't mean a word by saying a verse or a passage. I mean literally one word. And then you look up the meaning of that word and you're thinking like, what is this? What is this? There's something here. And then Holy Spirit then enlightens you. And then you, wow, wow. And it just makes me want to praise, praise God ever the more. And I am so looking forward to Jesus calling us up. And right now, brothers and sisters, that is about to take place. Don't be concerned. We are, this is at the door. There's more that I could say about it. I will say that for later. I am wanting you get into prayer and to, and, and to, you know, if you've got any unconfessed sin, do that now, get it out. Let Jesus wash your feet so that you, you know, you walk in this dirty world, right? The feet get dirty. Let's, let's, let's get that dust knocked off of our feet. Let's let Jesus do it by the washing of water by the word, right? That's what we want to do. So that when we hear that trumpet sound, which is just about to sound, then, we're, then you know that you're going up. Amen? All right. 
Amen. Brothers and sisters, I thank you so much for it. Uh, and I hope this has been a blessing to you. And I look forward to seeing you all in the clouds. For those of you that have been drawn by this and you have prayed that prayer we discussed earlier and you have truly given your heart, everything in you to Jesus, you've accepted that free gift, then I want to welcome you to the family of God and I look forward to meeting you in the clouds as well. Hallelujah, hallelujah, roll call, all right, amen. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Maranatha.